Simpleton Peter. There was once a young man called Peter, who lived in a country village with his old widowed mother. He was a good-hearted fellow, tall and strong, but he was one of the simplest of men ever born. He could scarcely count his mother's hens, though she had only a score. If he spent threepence out of a shilling, he hardly knew how to work out the change. And as for going to market, he never went without being cheated. It was not for want of trying. It was not because he was lazy. It was just that poor Peter seemed to have been born with scarcely any brains in his head. Oh, mother, he would say, if only I'd been given just a wee bit of brains, I'd not be so much trouble and worry to you. Aye, Peter, his mother would say with a sigh. You're short of brains, there's no doubt. But you're a good boy and as strong as any other too, so don't you let it worry you. Now run upstairs and get me three buttons to sew on your jacket. And mind you, three is three and not two nor four neither. All the same, Peter used to fret about his foolishness. So he continued to pester his mother till at last she said, Well, if you want to come by some brains, just take a walk to the wise woman who lives on the hill. She's a right clever body, they say, with her magic books and her pills and potions, and perhaps she can help you. So when his work was done, Peter walked up the hill, and on the top he found the cottage of the wise woman, with smoke coming out of the chimney and a black cat stretched out asleep in the doorway. Well, that's a good sign, said Peter to himself, and knocked at the door. There was no answer, so he lifted the latch cautiously and looked in. There was the old woman staring a round black pot on the fire. She neither turned nor said a word, so Peter stepped inside and said, Good day to you, wise woman. Um, it is a very fine day, to be sure. The old woman said nothing, but went on staring. Maybe we shall have rain tomorrow, Peter went on. But still the old woman said nothing. And uh, maybe we shan't, he said, wondering what to say next. Still, the old woman went on stirring. Well, now, said Peter, that's all I have to say about the weather, so let's come to business. I'm um, a very simple fellow, and I came to see whether you could supply me with a wee bit of brains. You see, brains, said the old woman, putting down her spoon and turning round for the first time. Yes, I dare say. That depends on what sort of brains you want. If it's king's brains, or soldier's brains, or schoolmaster's brains, then I can't help you. What sort of brains do you want? Just ordinary brains, said Peter. Middling good and middling bad, like most of the folk round here. Very good, said the wise woman. Such brains you shall have, but you must fetch me the heart of the thing you like above all others. Do you understand? And when you have brought me that, you must answer me a riddle, so that I may tell whether you have really brought the thing I ask for. Now be off with you. Without waiting for an answer, she took up the pot and carried it into the back kitchen, leaving Peter to let himself out. He went off down the hill, thinking about what the wise woman had said. The heart of a thing I like above all others, he repeated to himself. Now what can that be, I wonder? For this was not the sort of thing Peter usually thought about. When he got home, he told his mother what the old woman had said, and his mother thought the question over. At last, she said... Why, there's nothing in this world you like better than fat bacon, if you ask me. So we'd best kill the old sow, and you can take its heart to the wise woman. So the old sow was killed, and her heart removed, and Peter took it next evening to the cottage on the hill. The wise woman was sitting in a chair by the fireplace, reading a great book. He scarcely looked up, and Peter put the heart down on the table. There it is, he said, the heart of the thing I like best in all the world. Will it do? The old woman looked up from her book. What is it, she said, that can run without feet? Tell me that. Um, what, what is it that, that uh, can run without feet, repeated the young man, and he scratched his head and thought and thought till his head ached. The old woman went on reading. At last Peter spoke. I tell you what, he said, I don't know. Well, that's not the thing I asked for, said the old woman. Take it away and be off with you. There was nothing for poor Peter to do but pick up the sow's heart and go home again. 
When he got near his own cottage, he saw there were people standing about the doorway, and some of the women were crying. Then he learned that his old widowed mother had been taken seriously ill and was near death. He went inside the cottage and closed the door. The old woman was indeed very feeble. Peter saw there was nothing to be done, so he knelt by the bedside and took her hand. Say goodbye to me, son, she whispered, for I'm going to leave you. But now you've been to the wise woman and got yourself some brains, you'll be able to look after yourself. Peter had not the heart to tell her that he had got no brains and hadn't even been able to answer the wise woman's riddle. Instead, he kissed his mother and said, All the same, mother, I shall miss you badly. Goodbye, mother dear, goodbye. Goodbye, my son, said the old woman. And with that, she closed her eyes, smiled at him faintly, and died. Peter stayed for a long while, kneeling by the bed, crying and crying, for he could not stop the tears from coming, and he thought of all she had done for him, how she had brought him up as a little boy, and healed his cuts when he fell over, and cooked his meals, and mended his clothes, and talked to him, and been company for him in the evenings. He wondered how in the world he'd get on without her. For, said he to himself, of all creatures in the world, she was the one I liked best. Then he thought of the wise woman's words. Bring me, she had said, the heart of the one you like best in all the world. That I shan't, he said, not for all the brains on earth. But next morning he thought he might take his dead mother up to the old woman without taking her heart out, for he was even more in need of a bit of brains than ever. So he put his mother in a sack and took her up the hill. This he did without difficulty, for his mother had been a frail little woman, and he himself was as strong as any two ordinary men. He laid the body down in the wise woman's cottage and said, Now this time I've surely brought you the thing I love above all others. Here is my very own dead mother, and now you must give me the brains you promised. Tell me this, said the wise woman. What is it that is yellow and shines and isn't gold? Oh... Uh, what is it that is yellow and shines and isn't gold? Peter said in a dazed way. Why, um, it, uh, but he couldn't think of the answer for the life of him, so at last he said, I don't know. Then you shall get no brains today. You're a simple fellow indeed, and maybe you'll never have any at all. So Peter took up the sack with his mother inside and went out. But he was too sad to go home. Instead, he sat by the roadside and began to cry. Presently, he heard the sound of a gentle voice at his side. He looked up and saw a handsome young girl watching him with a kindly smile. What's the matter, she asked. I'm sorry to see a great fellow like you in distress. I'm a simple fellow, said Peter, without any brains, and now my mother has died and left me all alone. So how I'll manage from now on, I don't know. There's no one to cook for me and sew for me and manage the marketing, and worst of all, there's no one to talk to me and cheer me up when I'm in trouble. I'll help you, said Jenny, for this was the girl's name. A simple fellow like you shouldn't be without someone to look after him. Will you let me come and look after you? If you like, said Peter, but you'll find I'm a more than commonly stupid man unless I can get some brains from somewhere. Well, said Jenny, they say that a foolish man makes the best husband. Will you marry me? Can you cook, said Peter? Yes, indeed, said Jenny. Can you sew and mend clothes? To be sure. Can you count eggs and add up pounds, shillings and pence? Well enough. Then if you'll marry me, I'll have you, agreed Peter. Off they went, and after Peter's mother had been buried and all the village had mourned for her, the two of them were married and made their home together in the cottage. Soon Peter, simple as he was, began to see that he had got a very good wife. She cooked and sewed, mended and washed, all with the greatest cheerfulness and goodwill, what is more, she kept Peter amused with her witty talk and her gentle ways. Peter was not a bad husband either, for he too worked cheerfully and well. Nothing was too much trouble for him, as long as he didn't have to think. No weight was too much for him to lift, and no distance was too great for him to walk. In short, they were as happy and contented a couple as had ever set up house together in the village. Boy, Jenny, said Peter one evening, 
I believe that of all the creatures in the world, you're the one I like best. And these words put an idea into his head. Surely he went on the wise woman didn't mean me to kill you and take her your heart. Do you think she could have meant that, Jenny? I hope not, said his wife. Indeed I do. Who said anything about killing? Why not take me up to her, alive as I am, heart and all? That's a very good notion, said Peter. Why couldn't I have thought of it myself? Just you come along with me. But first you'd better see if you can answer riddles. Tell me, what is it that can run without legs? Why, a river, to be sure, said Jenny. That's not very hard. A river, repeated the simpleton. Of course. Now, why couldn't I have thought of that? But tell me this. What is it that shines and is yellow but isn't gold? The sun, said Jenny, without stopping to think. I could have told you that when I was five years old. The sun, said Peter in a puzzled way. Oh, yes, that shines, to be sure. And is yellow. <laughs> And it isn't gold neither. Why, what a head you have, Jenny. There can't be a man in all England with a cleverer wife than I have. Come along quickly now and see if the old woman will give me a little bit of brain so that I can be more your equal. So they went up the hill together and found the wise woman at home. Wise woman, said Peter, at last I've brought you the creature I like above all others. Here she is, heart and all. If you don't give me the brains I ask for now, you're no wise woman but a cheat and a fraud. Sit down, both of you, said the old woman. They sat down and she turned to Peter and said, Now then, here's my riddle. See if you can answer it. What is it that has first no legs, then two, then four? Poor Peter thought and thought, but the answer would not come. Then Jenny whispered in his ear, A tadpole, say a tadpole. A, 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 a tadpole, said Peter promptly. And the old woman said, Right, now I see you've got all the brains you want and they're inside your wife's head. If a man has a clever wife, she's all the brains he needs. Now be off with you and don't come bothering me any more. Peter and Jenny got up, thanked the old woman and went on their way. As they went down the hill, Jenny was singing quietly to herself, but Peter said nothing. What are you thinking of? she asked gently, stopping in the middle of a song. Peter left off scratching his head and said nothing. At last he turned to her and answered, I was only thinking how proud I am to have such a more than commonly clever young wife. To be sure you told the old woman just what she wanted to know. All the same, he went on in his puzzled way, all the same. I can't see just why it should be a tadpole that has first no legs, then two, then four. I've puzzled it out and I've puzzled it out and still I can't understand. I just can't understand.